Hello. Welcome to Analog Lab, week 11. This is not Steve, this is Mark. And this week, I'm going to give you an overview of guitar pedals. Uh, this is going to be a little bit of a show and tell. Uh, I have previously had experience working with the guitar pedal company Death by Audio. Uh, they are a small um, guitar pedal manufacturing company that started in Brooklyn in the early 2000s, and they currently operate out of Ridgewood, Queens, and all of their pedals are handmade and hand soldered. Uh, so, you know, it, for anyone here who is hoping to learn something about guitar pedal manufacturing from this class, I'm going to show you a couple things uh, that could hopefully be helpful uh, for this. So, uh, I'm going to try and be as thorough as I possibly can. And um, yeah, then we'll, uh, you know, field questions after the lecture. So, uh, with that, I'm going to start uh, with knobs. So, in this class, you're pretty familiar with potentiometers. There's a few different kinds we've worked with, and you've used a few different values. Um, you've probably seen some like this with these pins that fit nicely into a breadboard. Uh, here's one with some right angle pins. So if you wanted them to sit like this, uh, you could sit like that. We've also come across other pots, I don't know if I have any here, with solder lugs, uh, where it's easier to solder wires than to plug into a breadboard. So. We've already kind of talked about the different kinds of potentiometers. You're probably familiar with the A and the B uh, delineation. So you could see this is inverted in my camera, but this is a B25K. So B for uh, linear, A for logarithmic or uh, audio is how I like to think about it. Uh, there's also a C pot, which is for uh, inverse logarithmic, uh, but that's something we don't really deal with on a regular basis. Now, the difference between A and B pots, uh, we talked about in class, right? Um, you want to use A pots for things like uh, decibel control, volume, filters. B pots are for linear things, like if we do any sort of crossfader or, um, you know, we're adjusting the amount of voltage into our oscillator. That's what the B pots are good for. However, we haven't really talked about the other properties of potentiometers. And as you might notice, these two potentiometers that I've got are, uh, have slightly different shafts. This one has sort of got these ridges around the outside, whereas this one is just completely smooth. And the reason I bring this up is because once you start to get into uh, the finishing step of making your project, you may want to put something like a knob on the end of your potentiometer. And so I've got a few different kinds of knobs here. And if you do a Google search for knobs, you'll probably find hundreds of different kinds of knobs. Uh, they're not very expensive. They're just little plastic pieces. Um, and they attach to these uh, potentiometers in different methods. And the first thing I want to talk about is the difference between knurled, uh, that's knurled spelled K-N-U-R-E-L-D, versus a set screw uh, knob. So let's first look at a knurled knob. Now this black knob here uh, does not have a set screw in it at all, and that's because the interior of this knob is built to attach to a knurled shaft, which is what this potentiometer is. So this just presses on, and the ridges on the potentiometer mate nicely with the ridges inside this knob. And I don't need to do anything after the fact. I can just set this to the proper point, and it will turn this potentiometer. Now, typically speaking, when we're attaching this to a guitar pedal, uh, and I'll bring out this one as an example, you have, uh, and I probably have to take this off to show you, you have to actually take this washer, this nut, off 
of the potentiometer first. This goes on the inside of the guitar pedal, right? Pushes through the hole, and then to hold it in place, we drop our washer and our nut from the top. So the only thing poking through here is this shaft, right? Everything else is underneath, it's so you can attach it to the circuit board. And we'll take a look at that more a little later. So for many of these other knobs, you can see there's a little screw here. And on my smooth shaft, if I press this in, right, I'm gonna need a tiny screwdriver, which I don't actually have here, but you have to loosen this, press it on, and then tighten it to actually make this work with the pot. Uh, this knurled knob will not actually go on here because it's not built for this kind of shaft. So one thing to remember here when you're sourcing potentiometers for your project, uh, you have to think about whether you want to go with knurled knobs or set screw knobs. And the vast majority of the knobs that I have are set screw knobs, just because I think that's the vast majority of knobs that are sold in stores. Um, this is what a set screw looks like. Uh, I've actually had one fall out, so I can just screw it back in and it will work. So just be wary if there's just a hole and you find a knob and there's no set screw, it's not going to work. You're going to need to have the set screw in order for this whole operation to work together. So let's see, and some of these are different sizes. So usually these will come with a set screw. If they don't, well, that's just a bad company. So even though uh, potentiometers are kind of all made different, they all work very similarly, right? So we've talked about logarithmic and linear pots, but we haven't talked about different styles, right? We've only really been working with rotary pots in this class. Um, but there is another kind of pot that you're all probably familiar with, and that is a slide pot, right? This is what you're familiar with on soundboards and mixers. And if I flip this over, I can see that it's a B10K. It's just a linear 10K pot. And my pins are labeled one, two, three on this side. So one and three, these are my outside pins and two is the middle pin. You can tell because two is offset a little bit from one and three. And so you wire this up just like a rotary pot, except instead of turning it clockwise, you slide it back and forth, and this changes the resistance. And you can get knobs that fit on slide pots. I don't have any here right now, but you could imagine they look pretty similar to what you'd find on a mixing board. And uh, those are also just press fit. They just slide right onto here and you can control them with a small plastic piece. Slide pots have these two mounting holes. So because there's no way to easily affix it to an enclosure, uh, usually what happens is a long slot is cut and then you can just screw in from the surface through the material into these holes to hold it up to the surface. And so, if you go through some of the old projects uh, in the week one lab, you might see a couple people opting to use slide pots for their project because depending on what they're making, sometimes a slide pot is a better option. So you may be asking, where can I get things like this? So let me just pop open uh, my screen share here. Uh, my go-to place is usually Small Bear Electronics. I like them because they're based out of Park Slope. Uh, it's one guy. I once emailed him and said, hey, like, I wonder what happened to this package. And he said, no problem, I'll drop it off personally. So it's, it's a small company and they're really, really great. And they have a lot of different parts uh, and other things that I would recommend for this particular lesson. However, Due to the shutdown in New York, uh, the online store is closed. 
So uh, despite my affinity for small bear electronics, I won't be able to actually, actually show you their parts list uh, today. But I would encourage you to keep this link uh, handy because they tend to be pretty competitive pricing. They have a lot of options. And once the quarantine is over, you should be able to go here uh, for your parts. So I'm going to go to my, uh, my standard place for buying electronics, and that is Spark Fun Electronics. You bought stuff here uh, at the beginning of the semester. And I can search for things like a slide pot. And I've got a couple options here. These motorized ones that I don't really need. Uh, here's a small 10K. Here's a medium 10K. Small and medium are just how big the slide pot is. So you can see, this is still a 10K pot. It's just kind of tiny. Versus here is a medium 10K pot that is medium sized, $2.50. So you're not really breaking the bank with a slide pot. Uh, and then here's a knob for a slide pot, 95 cents. And so this will press fit onto the shaft of any slide pot. And there's a couple different ones here. Some of these are in stock, some of these are out of stock. So I would just be wary of what you're buying. And this is only one manufacturer, right? Like I can go to Adafruit, who is based in New York. And actually, Adafruit, I, I tend to order them both equally, but Spark Fun's based in Boulder, Colorado. Adafruit's based in New York. If you want something in a hurry, maybe look on Adafruit first. Uh, both of them are probably around the same price. Here's a slide pot for $2.95, you know, 45 cents more. Uh, there's a bunch of different things here. So, you know, look on both sites. Here's a dual pot. We talked briefly about this in the filters class. Control two things with one shaft, right? And uh, you can see most of these have a knurled shaft on them. So, you know, I think when it comes to buying things, just kind of know what you're looking for before you go out and buy it. Okay. So, uh, that is, think everything about potentiometers. Uh, there are other pots out there. There's like flex sensors that work like a pot where you bend them and the resistance changes. Uh, there's all sorts of crazy stuff you can do. But I would say traditionally, since we're talking about guitar pedals, uh, these are the guys that get used most of the time. And I'm going to open up a guitar pedal in a little bit. We'll take a look at what's inside. Okay, I'm going to push this off to the side. Okay, next thing I want to talk about are switches. So in our labs, we've built uh, a lot of things with a little breadboard switch, right? Toggles back and forth. Very similar to this, except this boy is a little bit bigger. And you can see underneath, instead of three pins, I've got six pins. And so I think now is probably a good time to introduce you to the world of switches. And we're going to be using words like poles and throws to talk about them. So back to the internet. I'm just going to search for SPDT switch. Don't worry about that right now. We're going to talk about it in a minute. Um, I think the Wikipedia article is probably the best place. Let me see if I can find it. All right, so if I go to switches on Wikipedia, I get a lot of nonsense about switches. What I'm looking for, though, is this abbreviation, SPST, single pole, single throw. And here is the symbol over here, right? So you can see this looks like how we've been drawing switches, except it only has two terminals instead of three. So down here, when we look at SPDT, single pole, double throw, this is the diagram we're used to seeing, right? Single pole are one common pin, double throw. So the throws are like the two options. So if I've got a single pole, double throw, I have three pins. One is the pole, and I have two for 
the throws. Now, this switch on my desk is a double pole, double throw. So if I scroll down to this diagram, this means I have two common pins, which are my two center pins. And each of those have their own two options. So with one switch, I can change the course of two different circuits, right? Double pull, double throw. And you can imagine I can expand this endlessly by the number of poles and the number of throws. So if I wanted something that had, let's say, two poles and six throws, that is also a thing. Now, you may be thinking, like, I can't even imagine what that looks like. You know, what even is that? So you've probably dealt with something like this. You probably don't recognize this. But if I turn this, this is simply, you may not be able to do it without pliers. This is a rotary switch. As I turn this, it's going to click through a bunch of different positions. So click, 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 click. I have options, right? So on the inside of this, I've got one, two, three poles. And then all around the outside, each pole has three throws. So using this rotary switch, this is a triple pole, triple throw rotary. As I turn this around, even though my hands aren't strong enough to do it, this will flip the three interior poles between one, two, and three throws. And rotary switches can be used for a lot of different things. Like let's say you wanted to route a signal through three different paths. You may have seen this on professional guitar pedals, right? You cl click it once to route it one way, you click it again to route it another way. Um, some of these are even configurable where they give you the option to use one pole and five throws or two poles and three throws. And there's a little washer that you just turn to set what you want to do with it. Uh, this one is not configurable. This is stuck in this triple pole, triple throw that I have configured. But I've used single pole 12 throw rotary switches if you need a whole lot of different positions. So, you know, switches aren't only in this style, right? Anything that just changes the route of a circuit is a switch, right? And so let's take a look at some other kinds of switches. Here's another. This is kind of a big toggle switch. On and off, just two positions and only two pins, right? So this is actually a single pole, single throw. And so what that means is, and they've nicely labeled these on and off, when I flip this to the on position, this, these two are connected together. When I flip this to off, they're just not connected to anything. So it's not even as useful as what we're using in class because it doesn't even give us a second option, but this can be traditionally used in an on-off circuit, right? Because I only want to connect one thing when I'm on. When I turn this off, I'm just disconnecting the circuit entirely. So sometimes if you want something like this, you want a really big, beefy on-off switch, and you're not actually routing the circuit anywhere in the off position, this might be the best option for you. This is probably something like $3. So as you get into bigger switches, uh, the cost goes up, but you're really not spending more than five or six dollars, even for the most expensive switch. So there's really a lot of different ways to go when it comes to switches. And uh, I only grabbed several things from my studio, but uh, as you can imagine, if we go to a place like eBay and we look for, say, electrical switches, There are, well, mostly outlets. Let's see. Uh, let's look for this on Amazon, maybe. Uh, electronics switches. 
here we go. So here's some toggle switches. Uh, here's a selection of switches that I can get. And you can see there's toggle switches at the top, right? This is what we just looked at. But there's also these kind of buttons. And uh, these are also panel mount. You can see there's a washer. And there's also two pins. So buttons are also a type of switch uh, that just doesn't hold its position. Uh, here are rocker switches. You've probably seen things like this, right? And this is a pack of how many? 15 pieces for $7. Um, so, you know, pretty cheap stuff. You probably uh, have used types of these on different sorts of electronics. And um, you're probably familiar with tons of different kinds of switches that aren't even pictured here. And so, you know, when it comes to interfaces, uh, there's many different kinds of switches you can get. And um, mostly, uh, the difference between a switch and a button is that a switch holds its position when you flip it, while as a button, when you let go, typically uh, changes. And so, let's take a look at some buttons. Let's move these guys off to the side. I've got two types of buttons that look pretty similar, but actually have quite different functions. Uh, so some of you use some buttons in class. We didn't really get a chance to get to buttons, but what a button usually is, is a momentary switch. When you press it, it engages the circuit. When you let go, uh, it lets go of the circuit. However, there are other kinds of buttons. And if I press this one, I don't know if you can hear that, there's a click. When I press this button, it's silent, right? This is the best way to differentiate between these two types of buttons. Of course, in the data sheet, it will also tell you. Um, this button, the silent one, functions exactly the same, right? These two pins, when I press this, will be connected together. And when I let go, they will be disconnected. This is a momentary button, right? Momentary meaning that the circuit is only connected when I press it. When I let go, it is disconnected. Right. This is great if you're making things like, uh, you know, a, a, a scale for your oscillator. Right. You want to have a bunch of different keys. Well, you want a bunch of momentary buttons because when I press one and I let go, I don't want it to stay on that note. I want it to stop so that when I press the next one, that's the circuit that gets connected. However, in guitar pedals, it's a little bit different. Sometimes you might want to turn something on or off. So this type of button, the one that clicks, this is called a latching button, right? Which means when I press it, it holds those two pins together. When I press it again, it disconnects them. So while they may look the same on the surface, the functionality of these two buttons is actually quite different. Uh, this one will connect the circuit and then disconnect the circuit right? It holds it in place. You may be familiar with this, probably more so, something like this, right? You stomp on it, turns your pedal on. You stomp on it again, and it turns your pedal off. So this is kind of the type of switch that we use in guitar pedals. And actually, I'll bring back this one that I've been using as an example. And you can see this is exactly the same as this component, right? This latches when I press it. And when I press it again, it unlatches, right? So typically speaking, this piece, this piece, this is the standard true bypass switch that every guitar pedal manufacturer uses or at least they did about five years ago when I was involved in this stuff. I don't know if anything better has come out, but I know that this switch uh, is the stomp switch that almost every guitar pedal manufacturer uses. Why? Let's take a look at it. This has nine connections. 
So you may be thinking like, okay, this guy and this guy are pretty much the same thing. They do exactly the same thing. This guy has two pins. This guy has nine pins. Well, why? Like, why do I need nine pins? So we're going to talk a little bit about this guy. First of all, let's try and identify what type of switch he is. And go back to my switches. And let's see if I get to the right place here. Perfect. So this isn't even listed in the examples on my switch types. However, I know that this is a three pull double throw. And you can see after two, after double, they just switch to numbers. Three PDT, four PDT, five PDT. So I'm going to search for a three PDT switch. And you know what? I find all of my stomp switches. They're all blue. They all look exactly the same. So 3P, triple pull, double throw, means I have three common pins that are all going to switch between two options. So kind of the same as our single pull, double throw, except there's three of them at the same time. Now, why is this important? So. In guitar pedals, when you press the stomp switch, two things are going to happen. One, your signal is either going to get routed through your circuit board or just directly from input to output, right? You're either using the pedal or you're not. However, a third thing is going to happen, and that is that you're going to light up an LED. And every guitar pedal has, let me just close this for a second. Every guitar pedal has usually next to the stomp switch, a little LED. And this is because when I'm using this pedal, I want this LED to light up, right? I want to see that it's on. Otherwise, how do I know? If there's no LED here, I can't tell if this is on or off. So this pairing is the standard guitar pedal uh, true bypass. When it's off, the signal goes from input to output, and that's it. When you turn it on, the signal goes through the circuit and it lights up this LED. So let's take a look at what that actually looks like. So let's see. Here we go. Here is the bottom of our triple pole double throw switch. Now, it might be hard to discern which is the middle, right? And the way I kind of think about it is when you look at it and all the pins are horizontal, that's when you can identify where the common pins are. So the middle row here, these are the common pins. These three are either gonna be connected to the top or to the bottom. So let's first look at what's connected to each common Left hand side, this is from the input jack. This is our signal from the guitar, right? Comes in, hits the leftmost common pin. The middle pin is connected to the output jack, right? Input, output, pretty simple. The third pin is connected to ground. And this might be kind of confusing for right now, but don't worry, we're gonna come back to this. Let's see what happens if these three are connected down to the bottom row. Well, on the left, my from input jack is going to be connected with a jumper to the output jack. So my signal comes in, it's connected across, and it goes straight out. We're in bypass mode. The ground is connected to nothing. This corner pin has nothing connected to it. Doesn't do anything which means I don't have an LED circuit to light up. When we're in bypass mode, the LED is off. Now let's look at what happens if I flip this to the up position. My from input jack, my signal goes to this pin, which goes to my PCB or my circuit. So my guitar signal comes in and then this pin goes out to the circuit board. 
does its thing, whatever it's doing, then it comes back from the PCB output into the top middle. And then it goes to the output jack. So basically when these three are connected to the top row, my signal gets routed up to the board, comes back, and then goes to the output jack, right? Then on this top right pin, I have nine volts. I have a resistor and an LED. Now, usually this would light up, but it's not connected to ground. I don't have a complete circuit here. So the trick here is, well, I connect this middle right pin to ground. Then when my circuit flips up, my LED turns on. Now, I could maybe put my LED in my guitar pedal circuit, right? However, there are some weird things with that, right? Sometimes I want power to my pedal, but I don't necessarily want to use it, right? So I don't necessarily want to turn my pedal on to tell if I'm in bypass mode or not. It's much easier to use the switch to determine whether or not the LED is turned on or not. And you can see this is its own circuit. It goes from power through a resistor through an LED to ground. It is not in any other circuit with my audio, which means that it's going to function whether or not my circuit board is working or not. It's much easier to troubleshoot because if my guitar pedal's turned on because my LED is lit up, I can tell if there's a problem with the rest of my circuit. It should be doing something. The LED is on, right? So this switch is super versatile. Uh, and if I ever forget how this is wired up, let's say I'm building a guitar pedal three months from now, um, you can just search for 3P DT uh, wiring diagram. And there are tons of wiring diagrams out there. I can click on any one of these and it will tell me exactly the same thing, right? Because this has been happening in guitar manufacturing forever. You can see in this diagram, they opted to put the battery and the LED in the middle column. It doesn't matter. Everything is kind of the same. And you can tell that the input and the output are used on two pins and the LED is used on the third pin, right? And, you know, I still refer to this today because it's not something I can commit to memory. There's a lot of wiring going on here, but as long as you kind of know the concept, you can just Google this device, this component, and look at it whenever you're wiring something up. There's four different options, depending on how you want to do it. So that is uh, pretty much a rundown of stomp switches. Now, we are talking about guitar pedals today, but since we're in the realm of buttons and switches, I figured I would show you some other things that I had lying around that are the same, but are not traditionally used in guitar pedals. So, here's a thing you might be familiar with. If anyone's ever gone to Barcade or any other bowling alley, you know, uh, roller skating rink, whatever. You may have seen an arcade joystick. So arcade joysticks, most of them anyway, are actually quite simple. On the underside, this might be hard to see with the camera. Let's see if I can angle it a little different. I've got four switches here. And as I move this joystick around, I'm engaging one of my four switches. See if I can get some more light in here. It's a little bit hard to see. So basically, around the exterior of this, I've got one, two, three, four switches, all with something formerly soldered to them. And you can see there's this big black plastic box on the inside. When I move the joystick, it's going to engage a switch, right? And if I move diagonally, I can engage two switches at once. 
And so, you know, when it comes to arcades, these are mapped to your up, down, left, right positions, right? But you can use something like this in uh, electronics. Maybe you have something that you want to play with a joystick and you're going to move this in four directions to create four different notes. Or you're going to have four different effects and you want to route your circuit, you know, four different ways. <clears throat> you can do it with uh, a joystick. And so this is something that I don't normally talk about in analog lab. It is a weird interface for musicians, but you know, in the interest of showing you every possible thing you can use, uh, I felt it was appropriate to kind of introduce you to the world of arcade components. Um, on a similar note, you can use arcade buttons and they function much like regular buttons. Yeah, I push this, it engages a switch. Now, you may notice that this switch has three pins. And that's because, and I can pop this out, which is really nice. You can see, this is the switch itself. The plastic part just presses down another piece of plastic, and that's what pushes that red button. But what's nice about this is I've got this washer. I can drill a hole that's about an inch, a little more than an inch, push that through the hole, screw this on from the underside, and then just pop this switch back in and it will uh, work perfect. So how, moment, how these arcade buttons work is this pin is my common pin. And then I've got the option of having a normally open or NO pin and a normally closed or NC pin. What that means is these two pins will function pretty much like you'd expect. When I press this, they are connected. Normally open means it's normally an open circuit. These two pins, on the other hand, are always closed until I press the button. And then it disconnects. This is a normally closed circuit. And so, depending on what I want to do with this, I can decide, well, when I press the button, I can close the circuit like I normally do, or maybe I have something that I want it to cut when I press the button. In that case, I would use these two pins, the normally closed pins. And so when I press this, it disconnects the circuit. And so, you know, you could see there's solder on these two, but not on this one. And that's because the normally closed circuit is not something that I normally use. Uh, it is kind of rare. However, you know, because uh, there are lots of different ways to wire things and sometimes you wanna press a button to make something stop. So that's why that option exists. And um, on the bottom of my joystick, you can see that every one of the switches here has the common, the normally closed and the normally open, which again, has no solder on it because I wasn't using it. Here again, common, normally closed and normally open is back here. So in arcade stuff, typically you're given both options. Now, arcade buttons are great. And uh, again, this is something where I would encourage you to go to eBay because eBay has large amounts of arcade buttons, generally for pretty cheap. And so usually you get these like uh, arcade DIY kits. Uh, this one's $40, that's too expensive. But here's six buttons for 16, also pretty expensive. Here's some classic used ones for a dollar. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Uh, let's see. Here's a bunch of different kinds you can buy. Some of them have like the one player, two player logos on them. Uh, here's 10 buttons. Uh, these don't even have the button part, but the replacement bulbs. There's all sorts of different things on here. Um, so, you know, if you want to go the arcade route, I would say 
look on eBay. There's lots of great stuff. Um, because I'm deeply in the arcade world, I can tell you there are great places like Paradise Arcade Shop. Uh, this is a Hawaiian themed arcade shop based in Minneapolis. I don't know, but they're cheap and you can buy a bunch of types of buttons here and joysticks. These ILs are actually very cheap um, for joysticks. Uh, here's one for $14. Typically joysticks are around 25. So if you wanna get some cheap ones to play around with, um, Paradise has some great stuff. Uh, if we can ever leave our apartments, again, uh, Video Games New York is amazing and uh, they're in the city. They're right on East 6th Street. And uh, they've got a lot of different kinds of things here. And you can go and look at their arcade sticks and their buttons and all sorts of old, weird, vintage video game stuff. Um, you know, there are buttons that have different kinds of weights. So you can press them faster or slower uh, or harder or softer. And there's all, there's a whole community and science behind arcade buttons. Um, that's a road I'm not gonna go down because it's kind of too granular for what we're doing. Uh, but another thing that I did wanna show you is, you know, um, if you like this format, but you're thinking, this button just isn't big enough. How can I get something bigger? Well, you're in luck because they make big arcade buttons. Same thing, same kind of switch. However, if I pop this guy out, this has an LED in it. And so this is kind of cool because what I've got here, I've got my two pins. They only gave me the normally uh, open pin on this model, but they've also given me two pins on the sides. And this side is red and this side is black, which tells me, well, red's usually positive and black's usually negative. So for my LED light, this is my positive side and this is my negative side. And I know this because if I decided to pop my LED out, uh, I've got the long leg on one side and the short leg on the other. And, um, you know, I don't know if you can see this on the camera, but inside this LED, there's a little 1K resistor just jammed in there. The protection circuitry is already here you don't have to build in protection. You've already got a resistor. So let me see, I wanna make sure I pop this back in the right way. So long leg is positive, I'm gonna pop that back in there. And then I can push this into my giant button uh, so that I can use it in my giant you know, project, whatever I'm gonna make and this will just snap into place like that. Now you might be thinking, that's cool, but I really, really need a big button. I know this is big, but it's just not big enough. Well, you're in luck. Because there are bigger buttons. You may recognize this because it's the same as the Staples easy button. It is gigantic, about the size of my hand. And uh, you can get all this stuff on Adafruit and probably SparkFun. I don't actually have a button in here. I think actually this will fit in here as well. Sometimes they're compatible, sometimes they're not. This one, ah, yeah, it'll work. So I can light it up. I can get this in red or blue or green. I can even dismantle this and like put some graphics on the inside. So if you wanted to get really crazy with it, you wanted some gigantic buttons, <clears throat> these do exist. And they work exactly the same as the other buttons. They're just huge. So let's take a look at them. Uh, I'm gonna go over to Adafruit. I've already got it open here. And let's just search for buttons. So we've got our Tactile buttons, you're used to these, you've seen these before. Um, here they are again with a little bit of a longer shaft. Now, if I keep scrolling down, <clears throat> Adafruit has so many kinds of buttons. Here's triangular buttons, if you wanna get real weird, all different colors. Uh, let's see. 
I might have to search for something to make this pop up. I think it's giant button. As you can see, there's 55 pages of things that contain button on uh, Adafruit. Here's a nice metal push button with a blue ring. $5, you're really breaking the bank, but this thing's gonna look really fancy and it's gonna light up. So, you know, you can go really stylish with your buttons. Here's a square button, uh, $4. A lot of the stuff's out of stock, but if you Google around, you'll be able to find them. Uh, here's another clear LED 250. Let's see if I can find at least one of these gigantic buttons before we call it quits. Because I know they are here. Let's just search for a uh, giant button. Nope. Let's search for arcade button. So here's a lot of what we were looking at before. Uh, these have the switches built in, so you don't have that detachable switch. These guys are also a snap-in, so you don't have a washer on the other side. You just press this in, and it kind of snaps into place. Usually not so good. Here we go. Massive was the word I was looking for. $10 for a massive arcade button. Um, but, you know, if you need one, you know where to get them. Um, these are out of stock. The white ones are in stock. Uh, large arcade buttons. These are the slightly smaller ones. They're $6. Uh, and you can see these have a couple different color options. Um, these are also probably available on SparkFun. So if you can't find them on Adafruit, uh, you can find them somewhere. They do exist. Okay. So that's enough with the buttons. clear my space a little bit <clears throat> before we get into our next component. So um, in our class so far, we've worked a lot with uh, input and output jacks via eighth inch headphones. However, when you are using a guitar or a whatever standard stage instrument, you're typically working with quarter inch jacks, right? And so we need a way to get our signal from here into our circuit. Enter the quarter inch jack. So I've got a few different kinds here. And, you know, on our uh, eighth inch jacks, we have a tip, we have a ring, and we have a sleeve. And uh, for what we've been using it for so far, you have. <clears throat> the tip is the left signal, the ring is the right signal, the sleeve is the ground, right? And so for our circuits that we made before the quarantine, we said, okay, let's just use the tip. We're just building a mono circuit, but if you want to hear out of both headphones, you have to connect it to both, right? Otherwise, and you probably noticed this in class, you're only listening to one ear. <clears throat> well, when we get to guitars, we only have a tip and a sleeve. There's no ring here. This is a mono connection. So when we get a quarter inch jack, you may notice on many of them, there is only a connection for the tip and a connection for the sleeve. And how this usually works is this pin, you could see, is connected to this metal ring. This is our sleeve pin, right? it is clearly connected. This other pin doesn't really look like it's connected to anything, but what's happening is it's connected to this long piece underneath. So if I were to take a multimeter and just check this connection between this piece and this piece, this is the piece that actually engages the tip of the cable. And this uh, here is where you solder to get that uh, cable out into your circuit. So this uh, quarter inch jack is pretty simple. There's a nut on the end and you can press it through a hole and you can screw this on and then um, you can plug into this and get it into your circuit, right? This is probably the cheapest kind you can get. Uh, 
you can see there's not much to it. It's only the connection. These are a little bit flimsy and sometimes uh, these things bend. Um, some of you may have been in a situation where your signal wasn't getting through anymore and you had to open up your guitar pedal and maybe bend this back because it's, uh, it's not the most structurally, uh, uh, it doesn't have structural integrity that other things do. So I brought along a couple other ones. Uh, this one's really nice because it has these pins so you could actually get it into a breadboard. And what I like about this is you can see like there's four pins here but there's only two connections. There's only a tip and a sleeve. And when I plug this in, let's see if I can see this on the camera. It actually disconnects these pins from these pins, right? If I pull this out, watch. Now they're connected. When I push this in, they're disconnected, right? What this means is that on the bottom, these two pins are gonna be connected together. And these two pins are gonna be connected together until I plug in something. And then these are no longer connected. These are four separate connections. Why is this useful? So let's think about something like a little portable keyboard, right? Maybe you have a little Casio keyboard or something similar, and it has a speaker on the inside. And it also has a line out. And maybe that line out is a quarter inch, maybe it's not. Well, maybe I would say, okay, let's hook my speaker up to one of these pins, right? One of the ones that's gonna get disconnected. Well, that means that the output of my circuit is gonna run straight through this out into my speaker, and it's gonna play. However, if I plug in my line out, I don't want my speaker to play anymore. I want it to go through my cable. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna actually disconnect the pin that goes to my speaker because now I'm plugged into an output and I'm gonna route the signal out through this cable, right? So having switches on your input and output jacks allow you to do things like this. You can actually have circuits that have switches that switch on or off when you plug them in. Some of you might have a guitar pedal that you can only use when you plug in an input jack, right? This is by design. They don't want you to drain your battery all the time. They want you to have to plug in a cord first before the battery actually gets connected to the circuit. Otherwise, when your pedal's just sitting around in your case, it's gonna be draining the battery and that's really not a great design. Uh, and I'm gonna talk about that in just a minute. Uh, I have one more quarter inch jack. This is uh, probably my favorite one. And this has one, two, three, four, five pins on it. And that's a lot for a quarter inch jack, especially considering we're usually only using a mono connection. So here's a tip sleeve uh, jack with four pins. This guy is actually a tip ring sleeve and each one has a switch. And this is gonna be definitely hard to see on the camera, but if I push this in, there's two switches in there that are getting disconnected, one on the tip, one on the ring. And so with five different connections, I can have a tip and a ring and a sleeve and two switches uh, that turn off when I plug something in. So you may be asking like, why? What is the point? Well, like I mentioned earlier, most of your standard guitar pedals, uh, they have what is both a nine volt battery on the inside as well as a DC jack. And the goal here is to not drain your battery all of the time. So I'm gonna put a pin in this for a minute and we're gonna come back to this. Uh, but first I wanna show you the DC jack. Now, 
in this class up to this point, we've been using dual nine volt batteries. However, in most professional guitar pedals, you've only got one nine volt battery. What that means is to make a bipolar power supply, you're taking that nine volt, you're running it through a voltage divider with two equal resistors, and you're splitting it into positive 4.5 and negative 4.5. And let me just see if I can show you a diagram of that. Uh, single nine volt bipolar supply. It is really not that difficult to make uh, just using a simple voltage divider. So let's open this up in a new tab and we'll sort of walk through. So here we have a nine volt battery. We have two resistors. They're both the same value. They're both 100 K. We have two capacitors here, uh, 47 microfarads each. Uh, and this is just for some smoothing of uh, noise in each voltage line. But as you can see, if we take the center point of these two resistors and set that to ground, then we've effectively made a voltage divider that has 4.5 volts at the top, negative 4.5 volts at the bottom, and ground in the center, right? So even though we've sort of been doing this with two batteries, uh, very rarely will you see a guitar pedal with two nine volts inside. Usually it's one nine volt battery, and if they need to make a bipolar supply, this is what they do, right? You're setting just a reference point to ground, positive 4.5, negative 4.5. Now, from what you know up to this point about comparators and uh, integrators, you know, usually your square wave is alternating between plus nine and negative nine. And for your non-inverting amp, you can amplify all the way up to nine volts. Well, when you cut your voltage in half, you're cutting your amplification in half. So you're gonna lose a little bit of the amplitude that you're used to on the labs we've made up until this point, but, if you want to simplify your circuit, you can build something like this and everything we've made in this class up to this point, you can use with one nine volt battery. Uh, this is just a little more complicated. So we like to use two batteries just to demonstrate it. Um, however, when it comes to making guitar pedals, um, most power supplies are nine volts. They're not plus and minus nine volts. So if you want this to be compatible with the other guitar pedals on your uh, rack, then these are the things that you need. And so let's go back to these for a minute. So this is how we usually plug power and you're probably familiar with these because they're in literally every single appliance that you own. Um, and there's a little pin in the center and there's a metal sleeve on the outside. And we may have mentioned this really early in this class, but usually if you look at a power supply, it'll tell you if it's center positive or center negative. And what that means is the little pin is the center, is the center pin meant to be positive or negative. So 99.9% .9 of things that you get will be center positive. The one industry that does not abide by center positive is guitar pedals. Guitar pedals, if you have a one spot adapter, take a look at it. It is center negative, which means that the middle is ground, the ring is positive. And to solder this up, this on the very back is gonna be the center. And I've got two other pins. You can notice this has three. This also has three. And you can tell this is the center because it's connected to the center point. So I know where my center pin is on both of these, but what are the other two? Should I only have one for the sleeve? Why are there three pins on both of these, right? It's only carrying two connections. So let's talk about this all in totality. Uh, I'm going to open up an image and I'm just going to talk about it for a second. 
So here I have a nine volt diagram. This is my DC connection. And here I have my input quarter inch jack. Now, this is how a standard guitar pedal works. When nothing is plugged in, the guitar pedal is off. The battery is off. You can't get any sound out of it. If I plug in a guitar cable, you can see my sleeve is connected to ground. My ring, which is nothing, is connected to the ground of my nine volt battery. And the plus side of my battery is connected to this middle pin on the switch. Now, this is important because when there's nothing plugged into my DC jack, my power input, my positive from the nine volt is going into the jack, it's connected, and then it goes out to the circuit board, right? So this is why when I plug in a guitar pedal, my nine volts is connected to my circuit via the DC jack. My ground of my nine volt battery is connected to the ring of my input jack. But what is the ring? Well, if we go back and look at this, there is no ring here. If I plugged a TS cable into a TRS jack, the ring is just going to get connected to the sleeve because there's nothing separating them. It's one solid piece of metal. So what is happening here in this circuit is when I plug this in, the ring is getting connected to ground through the guitar cable itself, right? I don't have to do anything. Just by plugging something in, I'm going to ground my nine volt battery. This is the ground of my circuit, right? So I've effectively said, let's turn my battery on. I've now connected the ground of my battery to the ground of my circuit just using the guitar pedal cable itself. That's great. That means I can use my pedal. However, I'm running it off of battery power. So now I want to plug it into the wall. I want to save my battery. So I'm going to use the DC jack. So remember what we talked about earlier about how all of these have little switches? Well, if I plug in a DC jack, it's going to unplug these two connections, which means I'm unplugging my positive side of the battery from the circuit board, which means I've broken the other side of my battery connection. So <clears throat> remember, when I have nothing plugged in, the battery positive is going through the DC jack into the circuit board, but the negative is a broken circuit. It's just hanging out on the ring connection. If I plug in a quarter inch cable, now I've grounded my battery and I'm using battery power. However, when I plug in a DC jack, now I've unplugged the power of my battery and I'm gonna use the DC straight from the wall. Now, the center, because it's center negative, is connected to the ring, which if I have an instrument cable, is connected to the ground. So efficiency, that's the name of the game here. We are not using power unless we need to. Uh, the prevailing thought in the guitar pedal world is that all guitar pedals are made this way. All power supplies are center negative because of the way we use batteries and power supplies in guitar pedals. Almost every single guitar pedal is built this way. Plug in an instrument cable, you ground your battery. Plug in a DC jack, you unplug the positive side of your battery because you don't want to use your battery and your external supply at the same time. So you're unplugging one when you're using the other. And so these are just some tricks that uh, go into guitar pedal wiring. And um, you know, if we take a look, 
Uh, and I don't even remember offhand which of these is the switch and which of these is the sleeve, but uh, I can use a multimeter and I can plug something in and I can figure out what is still connected and what's not if I wanted to know. Or I could just look up this part on a database. Uh, the other thing to note about DC jacks is this washer comes off. And unlike most things where you can push it up through a hole in uh, the uh, enclosure, this one, unscrew this all the way, this one goes in from the outside. And then you put this on on the inside, which means I can't solder this before I put it in my enclosure. Because once I have wires attached to this, I can't take it around to the outside of my enclosure and push it through the hole. I have to disconnect the wires and reconnect them. So what I usually like to do with this is put it in my enclosure first, tighten this nut from the inside, and then solder it once it's already mounted. Otherwise, I won't be able to do it because this has to be pushed in from the outside. So now that we've kind of talked about an overview of all of the different components, let's talk about the enclosures. And this is something I would have liked to show you on Small Bear because they've got a whole bunch of enclosures. Uh, now I've brought some of my own uh, just to kind of show you what these look like. And these aren't the cheapest things, especially if you want these aluminum ones. This is raw aluminum. Uh, this one's powder coated. You can see it's a lot glossier and nicer looking. And on the bottom, I've got these four screws. And if you own any guitar pedals, you might have something similar to this. You can take off the bottom, you can change the battery. Uh, but on the top side, this is where all the controls are. Now, these two enclosures have no holes in them which means if I wanted to build something, I'd need to take a drill with a drill bit for aluminum. Typically what I'd like to do is go into something like Adobe Illustrator or another graphics program and maybe make a little template with where all my stuff goes because I'm really bad at eyeballing things. So it's nice to have like a map of where I want things to go. And then I could take my drill and drill out holes for my potentiometers for my jacks, I could put stuff on the edge here, right? This is usually where the input and output jacks go. Uh, and, you know, practice makes perfect. I would uh, maybe start with cardboard and see how everything feels before upgrading to aluminum. Um, but you can find these in a lot of different places uh, because Small Bear's closed. You can get them on Amazon, uh, you can get them on eBay. You can even probably get some that are pre drilled. Uh, if we go to a place, let's see here. If I want a guitar pedal enclosure, you know, let's see. Uh, there's a couple options here. Guitarpedalparts.com. Uh, I can go to, let's see. Do we have enclosures? Here we go. Here's bare and powder coated. Now, Small Bear sells them pre-drilled. I don't know if other places do. Uh, I'm just sort of winging it right now, but uh, you can see $5 is actually pretty good. Um, die cast enclosure, $7.75. Again, you will need some kind of drill to make this work for you. Uh, and then the powder coated ones are probably a little bit pricier. Let's see, $8, $15 for this big one. Um, same deal, just a little bit nicer. And, um, you know, I'm not going to go into this too much, but if I go to the Death by Audio line of pedals, uh, what they do is they screen print the uh, graphics on the surface. So they get their enclosure, they get them pre-drilled because they know where all the holes go, and then they have this screen print that goes over top to get this nice decal. And, you know, uh, screen printing is a whole other art form. I'm not very good at it. You might be better and you want to try your hand. Uh, you're probably familiar with ZVEX pedals. Um, and if I look at the ZVEX line, a lot of these are uh, 
hand painted. And I think this might be a better way to go, especially if you're making your own pedals and you don't have access to screen printing. Like you can totally <clears throat> do something like this and get like a clear coat of spray paint. So just paint it with like acrylic paint and uh, you know, spray it with a clear coat of polyurethane and it works just fine. So, you know, as far as your graphics go, <coughs> go crazy. Um, you know, whatever your heart's desire, call it whatever you want. I would suggest labeling your potentiometers to tell people what they do, um, because just throwing three pots on there, sometimes it's hard to know what's the tone, what's the volume, et cetera. Um, but there's no real rules when it comes to guitar pedal designs. And, um, you know, there's lots of different uh, options out there. Again, this is not an art class, but uh, there's a lot of cool stuff you can do. So um, yeah, go nuts. Um, where was I? Let's take a look at uh, the interior of a Death by Audio pedal. I've got one here. This is a fuzz war. This is a distortion pedal. Uh, we've got a fuzz knob. We've got a tone knob. This is an overdrive. Uh, just another gain stage. Not much to it. Um, the fuzz war is one of the earlier models. Let me flip that over because I realize we're upside down and you're looking at everything upside down and backwards. Uh, so this is the fuzz war. And what I want to show you is what's going on inside this pedal because you know, there's really not a whole lot. And if you've opened up a guitar pedal, you've probably seen something similar. Here's the nine volt battery. And if I had to replace this, it's easy enough to do. It's zip tied to the circuit. Here is my three PDT switch soldered right to the circuit board. And here are my pots. They have these long legs, similar to this one that I showed you before. And it's so that you could attach it to the circuit board and solder it in place. And so you can see that this circuit board was custom designed so that it fits perfectly with all the parts in the right place. And so this is something that uh, is a little bit more advanced. And uh, Steve has a class that you can take that is more about fabrication and circuit board design. But basically, when you get into manufacturing, you're eventually, the goal is to get to this point, right? Because you want to solder your whole pedal together and you want everything to be connected on the board. You don't wanna to have to wire up everything. And so you can see on this board, everything's labeled, like what resistors go where, what chips go where, where do the pots go? And it makes it really easy to populate this by hand. And so at Death by Audio, there are several employees who just sit around and pop uh, components into a board like this, and then they pop it into the enclosure and they test it out and then ship them off. So all of the work is kind of done for you already. And um, a lot of these boards are made in a program called Eagle CAD, uh, which has a free and a subscription version. Uh, there's a free program called KiCAD, K-I-C-A-D, uh, and that's the software that Steve teaches in his fabrication class, uh, which is also really great. I'm not going to get into those uh, in great detail, but I do want to show you um, a place where you could order circuit boards, and uh, oshpark.com is a super, super cheap place to order circuit boards. And so this is like a down, 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 down the line uh, uh, place. But basically, if you wanted to make an Eagle file for your circuit board and send it away to get made, uh, Oshpark can make three circuit boards for about 30 bucks. Uh, and they're usually arrive in a couple of weeks. And it's a really great way to prototype something uh, before you manufacture it. Um, so this is like skipping over one step. Um, but typically what you are going to do, because you're going to make one pedal and 
you're not going to use a program to manufacture PCBs, <clears throat> you're probably going to use something like perf board. And so I've, I have a couple of different kinds of perf board here. And uh, perf board is simply a gigantic piece of uh, basically circuit board material with a bunch of little holes in it, and each hole has copper surrounding it. Now, when I was growing up, you had to solder everything by hand because the perf board had no connections made for you. Notice each hole is individual. And if I solder something, it's not connected to literally anything else. This has its pros and cons. Like on the plus side, I can do whatever I want with this. But on the minus side, everything that's connected to ground, I have to connect it together somehow. Usually I like snip off some wire and run it along a column and solder everything to the wire and now I have my ground. And so like it's, it's a little bit of a hassle. Um, however, Adafruit being the great company that they are decided why not make perf board in the shape of a breadboard? Because we're all used to the way breadboards are connected. You could see here, all the holes are connected in the same way as a breadboard. So Betafruit sells these in a few different models. And I'll go back. I actually had this open and I lost it. Uh, but let's search for a uh, proto board. And yeah, here we go. So we've got them in all different sizes. There's a three pack for 12 bucks. You can get a little one for 295. You can get a quarter size. You can get a big long one that's the same size as your breadboard for 20 bucks. This is a three pack for 20 bucks. Um, or a single one for $7. So there's all different styles here. Um, the one that I'm showing you actually comes for free if you buy more than $50 worth of stuff on Adafruit, which means I've got about 300 of these lying around. Uh, so if you want one, um, I can get it to you sometime after the quarantine ends. I've got a lot. Um, but I would say, you know, uh, for the final project in years past, when we weren't cooped up and doing projects at home, um, about 25% of my students, especially the ones making guitar pedals, would opt to transfer their circuit from a breadboard to this because they would like to have something more permanent. Um, now, one thing to keep in mind, metal, solder joints, metal box. If I were to mount this on the metal, metal is conductive, you're going to short circuit all of your connections, right? So something I like to do, especially if I'm using a metal enclosure, is to solder everything and then cover the bottom in electrical tape, right? Even though I have these two mounting holes here, and you could get little adhesive things that just stick to uh, the bottom of your guitar pedal, cover your solder joints with electrical tape. Uh, you don't want to risk short-circuiting short your guitar pedal because you finished it, you tested it, everything worked, and then you stuck it on a metal enclosure and everything broke because you short-circuited your stuff. So just be very aware uh, of what you're doing. I've also seen people coat the inside of their guitar pedal with electrical tape, and that's also something you can do. Um, so, uh, perf board, that's probably what I would recommend, uh, especially one of these because it matches your breadboard exactly, and um, it's very easy to understand lifting your circuit up from a breadboard, putting it in. Um, and so I think that's pretty much everything. Um, I want to show you a couple other things here. Um, this is something I made. It used to work and now it's a prop, but, uh, this was a little four step sequencer. These are little momentary buttons. Uh, these things are little plastic bezels. And, uh, if you want to mount LEDs on the surface, you might notice like, oh, these LEDs 
don't look very nice on a breadboard, but if I want them in a guitar pedal, I kind of want them in this little enclosure. And so all you have to do, and this is something you could get on Adafruit and SparkFun, uh, LED holder or LED B-E-Z-E-L. Uh, there are little plastic holders for LEDs. And um, on Adafruit, there are these little black things. And the LED just pops right in there and it just mounts into a hole uh, at whatever size you want. And you can see there's different bezels or uh, bevels for different LEDs. Uh, I think Spark Fun is where I got the ones that I have now. Let's see, LED bezel. Let's see if I can find them. They might be called holders here. There they are. The chrome five millimeter holder for 50 cents, 10 millimeter for 50 cents. Uh, pretty cheap. They're pretty flimsy. They're not great, but they look nice. And if you're going for a really nice finish, um, all you have to do is pop your LED in there, mount it to the surface, and you've got a pretty slick LED on the top of your enclosure. Uh, also on here, I've got four photo cells, uh, also in bezels, but you can see they don't look as nice because the photo cells are a little smaller. So you can kind of see, uh, underneath them a little bit. Um, so not great, but I figured if I wanted a photo cell on the surface of bezels, probably the easiest way to do that. Uh, and then on the top here, um, I've got a little toggle switch, turn this on and off and a little knob. Uh, I think this used to control the rate of the sequencer and this turned it on and off. This antenna is just for show. This doesn't do anything at all. Uh, I think this antenna is here because I turned this into a prop for a Rick and Morty Halloween costume. Uh, but it used to work at one point uh, and I thought it was a cool design in case anyone wanted to make something like, uh, you know, a little uh, note uh, synthesizer or something. You could easily adapt uh, week seven's lab to this and you could press each of these to be a different note and you could control the notes with these photo cells um, or something similar. So uh, that was what that was. Um, and so yeah, that's pretty much, uh, you know, the basics of guitar pedals. Uh, Obviously, I can go on about a lot of different things and we can look at different circuits, but uh, this is really the most useful stuff. And especially when it comes to components like switches and buttons, there's really a lot of stuff out there. And all it really does is connect and disconnect a circuit. So, um, you know, if you are someone in this class who really wants to get into guitar pedal manufacturing uh, or maybe have an internship, I know it's not really the best job market right now, um, but there are a lot of boutique guitar manufacturers in the city. And, um, you know, if they're not looking for interns, they might be able to answer some questions or give you a tour of their workshop uh, once this is all over. So, um, yeah, please reach out to me. Um, for those of you that aren't in my class, my email is mark at clebtronics.com. And this is going to be totally backwards and upside down. Uh, I'm not going to attempt to write this backwards. K-L-E-E-B-T-R-O-N-I-C-S.com. And um, I encourage you to ask me more questions about this stuff. If there's anything I didn't cover in this lesson, if you're curious about anything uh, related to switches and buttons, something that's confusing from this lesson that you'd like to learn more about, um, please, please reach out to me. Uh, you know, I'm happy to answer any and all questions and talk about anything related to guitar pedals. Um, so yeah, I hope you liked this lesson. I hope it was informative and uh, I will see you next week.